Hello, I am Dibanjan Chakravarti of the British Council and I am in conversation with Martin Lamb of Leeds University, uh, UK. Uh, welcome Martin and thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a very busy three days for you. It certainly uh, has. And um, thinking back, uh, uh, looking back at the conference, uh, what do you think is the relevance of a conference like this in the lives of uh, the teacher educators, people who present, people who come and attend? Uh, I think it has probably has different meaning for well for each person, but particularly for different types of delegate. Because I've I've seen that um, there are many different uh, kinds of participant here. There are teachers, there are teacher educators, there are university academics, um, there are people from rural areas, people from the city, there are foreigners like myself. Uh, and I think we all come and take away our own thing, in a way. Right. Um, but just the coming together, to being taken away from one's normal routine, uh, brought out into um, to join with others and be exposed to a kind of melting pot of ideas mm. um, can only be a good thing. Right. Talking of melting pot of ideas, Martin, I mean, the theme of this year's conference was diversity. Uh, does that uh, resonate with you uh, in your own professional context in a direct way? Well, definitely. Um, I mean, we've seen there is a diversity of participants here. And I think as a profession, um, as a TESOL profession, um, we are coming to recognize that diversity and com complexity um, is a very important notion that we have to recognize um, what we do with it. We're not sure, but um, people, for example, are starting to apply complexity theory, which is a scientific um, theory, um, to the social sciences. And um, we're, we're recognizing that just the classroom itself is such a complex environment. Uh, there are no easy solutions anymore to our problems. We have to recognize complexity, I think. Um, so yeah, I'd say the theme this year of diversity um, is a timely one. Right. Um, Martin, um, just looking back at uh, what you have uh, seen, witnessed, heard um, in the last uh, three days or so, uh, what are your sort of uh, initial impressions? Uh, any particular session or sessions that stand out? Um, it's unusual I can say this, but I honestly uh, have um, enjoyed every session that I've been to and I feel I've got something out of. Um, I could prove that mm. by showing you my notebook, right. uh, which is full of scribbles. <laughs> yeah. um, and... Of course, when one selective mm. chooses yeah. the, the topics um, of the lectures, yeah. of the talks. Um, for example, I've just been to a couple uh, of talks on problems of teachers and students in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a yeah. growing right. object of attention, yeah. and it should be. Yeah. Um, because... Um, particularly nowadays um, with, with the internet, urban learners who have access to the internet suddenly have a wealth of resources uh, for learning English, which they didn't have maybe 10 years ago. Or even five years ago, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's developing so yeah. fast, and that's such potential there. Um, whereas in rural areas, as we know, yeah. often those opportunities are still lacking. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And there are many other problems as well, such as uh, te low teacher salaries, low teacher morale, mm. and um, no um, a, a lack of literacy in family background right. and so on. Yeah. So I think I, I've noticed that it's another thing. Up, uh, we're looking at these right. rural areas, and we should be, because right. right. still the majority of learners. Come from there. I was speaking to your colleague uh, Martin Waddell and he mentioned that one of the sessions he went to, the one on um, the English goddess, which mm -hmm. the, some of the members of the Dalit uh, movement in India have, um, you know, almost uh, 
imagined or conjured up really shook his uh, belief in, in, in some ways. It was that profound. Uh, um, any, any particular session that has had uh, made you rethink some of your own academic positions? Definitely. Uh, and I would mention the session um, of at Ajit Mahanti. Mm. Uh, I, was, um, I was deeply moved by it. Mm -hmm. um, and it, well, what he was talking about um, was, uh, it was, it was not something new to me, but the, the, the importance of mother tongue education. Mm. Um, and I, I, I've read the articles on the mm. subject, um, but to actually listen to someone who's done extensive research on this topic, who is trialing um, some interventions mm. Uh, in the state of or Orissa, I think. Mm, yes. Um, and someone who spoke with such knowledge and mm. conviction mm. Uh, was very, very moving. And I, I, right. I, yeah, I think it's affected my thinking right. on, on the subject. Right. Um, and I, he's not the only one, actually, who's talked mm. about this. Yes. Um, I think it's... There have been a number of yeah. sessions on uh, multilingual education and bilingual education strategies at this particular conference. Uh, another session which f neatly followed on from that was by uh, Esther Amani and Michael right. Joseph from South Africa, right. who are, they, they neatly pointed out this dilemma of access and diversity. Um, you know, that, that um, sort of the need, that the fact that English does give access to mm. uh, to higher education, mm. to, to um, financial mm. rewards and so on. Um, and yet we also want to preserve linguistic diversity mm. and respect local people's identity. Yeah. Um, it, it's such a dilemma. It's a huge dilemma, particularly in India, uh, uh, Martin, because uh, one of the great ironies of the situation is um, India has now more or less got its act together when it comes to universalizing access to education. Um, enrollment ratios are anywhere between 95 to 98 percent, even by independent evaluations. Yet, only 12 percent of the children who uh, study in school eventually land up in higher education. But in the next 20 years, that percentage is going to reach 30. And uh, higher education in India, uh, unless you are studying one of the languages, it is entirely in English. Mm -hmm. um, and that is going to create a huge logjam of um, students, I think. Uh, it's a crisis looming around the corner. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the in, although there have been many problems aired at this conference, um, the fact is that I would guess that levels of English proficiency in India are generally higher than in, in most other countries of the South, I would, I would guess. Well, uh, yes and no, given that, you know, I mean, I think in terms of percentages, we are probably not um, all that different from other uh, South Asian countries. Um, at, at a conference like this, you're looking at almost a self selecting True. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, audience uh, yeah. who are coming to an English language teachers educators conference. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at the statistics, it's a lot more diverse and complex. There is obviously a bit more English in the environment in India. Um, this is a point that I'd made in a paper that I presented some years back that um, I went to a visit a very rural school in uh, West Bengal and there was there were very few signages in English, but everything that was being sold from the grocer's shop, I mean, packets of biscuits, packets of chips, uh, crisps, all those wrappings and, you know, branding was mm -hmm. in English. Mm -hmm. And that's practically universal in India. Mm. Uh, so if you look at, you know, um, you know, Coca-Cola is Coca-Cola. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In, written yeah. in English. I mean, in fact, India is probably one of the only countries where Coca-Cola hasn't really tried to um, Globalize, diversify like, yeah. its uh, script. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, which they do in many other countries, actually, if you mm -hmm. think about it. So. Mm. Yeah. So, the question is, I suppose, yeah, how, if if 
mother tongue education is important in the primary school, yeah. as Professor Mahanti yeah. was arguing very strongly, yeah. then it's going to put all the pressure on secondary school. Um, students will have to learn right. English in those six years of secondary school yeah. to get to a very high level, good enough to study in study English. Study in university. English, yeah. But maybe that's, maybe pooling resources at the secondary level. At the secondary level, yeah. Is, uh, yeah. is a sensible way forward. Yeah, because um, one of the things uh, we spoke about at the language and development uh, panel uh, yesterday was um, there was a very important question raised about from what grade should uh, Indian uh, state schools be starting, uh, should start English. Um, and there is a lot of um, difference of opinion there, but I think pedagogically it's fairly well established that you know if you start it from um, grade six um, and provide it for six, seven years uh, at a you know if the input is of a certain of a certain level and quality, then you can hopefully expect uh, students to pick up the language um, properly. Should be possible. Yeah. 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 Um, it should be possible. Yeah. And I, I, I think uh, that's it's preferable to take mm. the risk in a way than to um, to offer an inferior mm. kind of primary education mm. um, which actually might put learners off mm. the study of English yeah. um, at secondary school. Because if it's not done well at mm. primary school, there is that yeah. danger. Yes. Yes, of course, yeah. Thank you so much, Martin, for speaking to us. Uh, and it's been, as I said, a very long yeah, three well, days. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a uh, very uh, intense but enjoyable three mm. days. Mm. I can't wait to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Hope to see you back, Martin. Yeah, yeah. thank you.